once again, it's time to revisit some cool British singles released in 1966. Without further ado, here are some cool British singles released in May of that year. I see a red door and I want it painted black. May 1966 saw the release of one of the greatest singles of 1966, Paint It Black. The song, along with Shapes of Things by the Yardbirds and Eight Miles High by the Birds, was one of the first psychedelic singles ever released. It was also the first pop single to feature a prominent sitar. The Beatles had already pioneered the use of the sitar in Norwegian wood from the Rubber Soul album. But the song was never released as a single, and the main difference between both songs was that Norwegian wood featured a sitar playing along to a melody that was very much stepped in Western music while on the other hand, Paint It Black saw the Stones experimenting with exotic melodies with a strong Eastern and Middle Eastern flavor. 1966 also saw the Beatles experimenting with exotic melodies, but the Fab Four were absent from the recording scene during the first half of 1966, and Rain, a song which saw them fully experimenting with Eastern melodies, wasn't released until June 1966. Paint It Black featured both an unusual melody and an unusual lyric, the song, with its lyrics full of grief loss and nihilism, is also widely considered to be a precursor of gothic rock. Beat Instrumental magazine asked Brian Jones about how he got started playing the sitar. Brian Jones said, There's this fellow in the States, his name is Hari Hari, and he taught me the basic history of the sitar. He studied under Ravi Shankar for 12 years, and yet he still considers himself a pupil. These people dedicate their lives to the instrument, the single got mixed reviews when it was originally released. Some journalists thought the song was too uncommercial to become a hit. Penny Valentine from Disc Magazine gave the single a fairly positive review. I have to admit it. This certainly didn't knock me out with the immediacy of the last couple of Stone singles, but it does grow on you. Most people I know are walking around raving over this. But I found I had to battle through an incredibly Indian backing and get rid of the image of white cloaked shakes tearing across the desert on Arab ponies before it hit me what it was all about. Actually, Mick is singing better than ever, and the part where his voice comes in on its own is splendid. Very anti-social song about wanting to destroy just about everything in a doom-ridden way. Naturally a number one, and I'm pleased they're pleased with it. The single reached number one in both the UK and in the States and it was also a top 5 hit in several European countries. The Yardbirds were one of the first bands to experiment with exotic melodies. Their song Heart Full of Soul, released in mid-1965, was one of the first instances of a British band experimenting with Indian influences and Over Under Sideways Down, was another single which saw them experimenting with exotic melodies. The riff of the song featured Jeff Beck imitating the sound of a sitar with his guitar. Penny Valentine wrote, I can only suppose that on the next record, the Yardbirds will have the entire Dagenham Girl Pipers playing pick and shovels. Things have got to quite a pitch in their search for new sounds. On this, they have great clappings, Russian-type haze, Indian rave-ups, and a part that sounds like the Arabic call to prayer. In fact, I think it's fascinating and all very splendid. The song was probably Rush released as a single in order to stop the press from spreading rumors about the Yardbirds breaking up. Earlier in May, Keith Relf had already released a solo single, and its release prompted the press to speculate about a possible Yardbird split. Just as the world stands watching her plane flies above and with frost-bitten hands waves goodbye to his love. The track was a sort of folk rock reading of Mr. Zero by Bob Lind. A Swiss singer called Susie Clay released the same song as a single the same week as Keith Relf. And the press wrote articles trying to guess which of the two songs would become a hit. In the end, both singles flopped. The Yardbirds single, however, reached number 10 in the UK and number 13 in the States. The days are lonely, can't sleep in May 1966, Screaming Lord Such shortened his name to Lord Such and released one of the most bizarre singles of the month. Such got his start in the very early 60s, mixing rock and roll with horror-themed stage shows. 
but no one expected him to issue this early slice of psychedelia in May 1966. The Cheat was a sort of psychedelic reading of an old song by Lee Hazelwood, which was originally recorded by Sanford Clark in 1957. The B-side, a song called Black and Hairy, was more akin to the sort of material that people expected from Lord Such. With blood and worms hanging from his back, he outstretched his arms and his bones give a track. The song was a horror rocker about digging in the cemetery at night. Record Mirror wrote, Change of style for David, almost purring through a teen slanted ballad. Almost slurring, it might click. The single failed to chart. Another highlight of May 1966 was this single by The Animals. Don't Bring Me Down featured some great fuzz guitar plus a fantastic pulsating organ riff from Dave Rowery. The B-side was another excellent song called Cheating, written by Eric Burden and bassist Chaz Chandler. Cheating. Oh, yes, you have. Cheating. Down on me, girl, and Both songs were recorded at Serena Studio in Nassau. Unfortunately, the Animals broke up shortly after the release of the single, and their last batch of recordings was released on the album Animalism. Record Mirror wrote, Typical, and yet not typical, if you get the gist. Lots of highly commercial ideas incorporated in this one, with Eric Burden gradually building from quietness to fair wild abandon. Lots of Roberry organ skill and a dynamic beat. It may take time but it must be very big. The single reached number 6 in Britain and number 12 in the States. Hey, hey, it's all right. hey, hey, it's all right. The Small Faces released their fourth single in May 1966. Hey Girl was written by Steve Marriott and Ronnie Lane. According to Lane himself, the song was a compromise between the band and their manager Don Arden, as Arden wanted a very commercial sounding song. The band wasn't too happy about the sort of pop songs they were forced to record. The B-side, however, was more akin to the sort of material they liked to perform on stage. The song was an excellent instrumental with a great powerful sound that was very influenced by Booker T. Record Mirror wrote, Up tempo belter with some great singing from Steve Marriott. Perhaps the boys best yet. They get such a big instrumental sound with concise beat going. Don't worry about the lyrics, concentrate on the catchiness. The flip is equally big sounding. Good instrumental with good guitar. The single became the band's first self-written hit, reaching number 10 in Britain. As a curious note, after the success of Hey Girl, an employee of Robert Stigwood's management company contacted the band to see where they stood. When Don Arden found out, he visited Stigwood's London offices along with four assistants. They hung Stigwood by his legs from a balcony window and threatened violence if he interfered with his bands ever again. Listen to the music, and when you hear the beat, you just gotta strike the scene, you gotta move your feet. May 1966 also saw the release of one of the most underrated mod singles of 1966. This was the only single that the Favourite Sons ever released, and both sides have been featured on several compilations over the years. The band was originally formed as the Juniors in 1964, when all the members of the band were 14 and 15 years old. The group featured future Stones guitarist Mick Taylor, but they broke up after releasing one single for Columbia. Several members of the band formed another group and kept playing throughout 1965, opening for bands such as The Small Faces and The Who. The group was finally spotted by producer Mike Hurst while opening for Tom Jones at the Marquee Club in late 1965. After renaming the band to The Favourite Sons, Hurst produced their first and last single. The A-side was a great mod number with some excellent fuzz guitar lead and a few touches of psychedelia. And the B-side was another splendid tune with great guitar and a heavily echoed chorus that showed the band embracing the psychedelic influences that were starting to take the British scene by storm. The single, however, meant nothing in the charts. Due to its poor sales, this single has become a highly sought-after collector's item that has exchanged hands on Discogs or eBay for over £500. One of the most often discussed topics in the press throughout May 1966 was the Stones' new album Aftermath. 
The record was seen as a groundbreaking album and it got great reviews in the press. Whenever the Beatles or the Stones released new albums, several artists and bands would cover album tracks and release them as singles. And Aftermath was no exception. April 1966 had already seen The Searchers cover one of the songs from the record. And May 1966 saw several artists covering tracks from the album and releasing them as singles. Gene Latter covered Mother's Little Helper. Wayne Gibson released the cover of Under My Thumb. His cover went pretty much unnoticed when it was originally released. But oddly enough, by 1974, his cover of Under My Thumb had become well known on the Northern Soul Club scene. And such was the demand for the single, that the Pi Disco Demand label decided to re-release it. The single rose to number 17 on the UK chart in late 1974, more than eight years after its original release. And Wayne Gibson, who had already retired from the music business in 1966, briefly re-emerged to promote it on top of the pops. May 1966 also saw two artists covering Lady Jane and releasing it as a single. The song was covered by Tony Merrick My sweet Lady Jane. and David Garrick. When I see you again. Tony Merrick's cover was not a success, but David Garrick's cover managed to reach number 28. Disc Magazine reported, David Garrick has been known to stand in the corridors of Pi Records rehearsing his stage movements before a bewildered night watchman. He dresses neatly, combs his hair, and eats puce-colored yogurt with the help of the lid. David Garrick does Lady Jane on stage with the maximum amount of hand-kissing. He doesn't consider his act directly connected with sex. It receives a very favorable reaction with the girls but their boyfriends don't like it at all. David Garrick said, I can take care of myself. But when there's 30 of them looming towards you it isn't so funny. I'm getting rather scared. I'm seriously thinking of hiring about 50 small bouncers and bodyguards to take around with me. The worst of these Aftermath covers was probably a cover of Stupid Girl by a band called The Attractions. Their version featured a pretty mediocre backing track and some pretty terrible singing. Ironically enough, the band seemed to think that their version was far better than the Stones' original. A couple of weeks after they released their version, the band's lead singer sent this letter to Disc Magazine. Dear Mick Jagger, thank you for silently applauding our version of Stupid Girl from your LP Aftermath. You have slated all other cover versions of numbers recorded from the LP and not had the decency to come out publicly and declare that our version of Stupid Girl is obviously better than yours. You and Keith write fabulous numbers, but are you getting too old to perform them? What is the average age of the lads? It must be 27, or is it 28? Maybe even 29? Carry on writing, but make way for us Mr. Jagger, and go roll your stones somewhere else. Your last record didn't reach number one at all. So it appears to us that you are over the top of the immediate mirage. So watch out. The attraction single, perhaps not surprisingly, failed to chart. The best of all these Aftermath covers ended up being Chris Farlow's cover of Out of Time. But the single was released in June 1966 so it will be featured in next month's episode. But there were still more Stones covers released in May 1966. Twice as much was a duo that Stones manager Andrew Oldham had signed to his label Immediate Records. Sitting on a Fence was a song that Jagger and Richards had written during the Aftermath sessions, but they ended up not including it on the album. The Stones' own version of the song was finally featured a year later on the album Flowers. I hope you enjoyed this trip back to May 1966. See you next time.